Join me today is our friend and colleague, Dr. Susan Einbinder. Dr. Einbinder is a professor of Hebrew and Judaic studies at the University of Connecticut. Previously, she taught Hebrew literature at the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati. Also, Rabbi Einbinder is an ordinary of the Hebrew Union College. Dr. Einbinder has written on medieval European Jews with a focus on literary and not literary testimonies to violence and catastrophe. She has published three, three books and dozens of articles. And I want to say excellent articles and books. Here a new book, Writing Plague on Jewish Responses to the Great Italian Plague on of 1630-31 should appear soon with the University of Pennsylvania Press. On a personal note, Dr. Einbinder is a good friend of the library for many, many years. We are grateful, grateful for her ongoing support. Please welcome Dr. Susan Einbinder. Thank you. Um, and I'll start by saying thank you to uh, Yoram Biton for this invitation, um, to Abigail Bacon for her help with scans and um, arrangements and handholding um, <laughs> to the um, Clow Library, which is one of the great treasures um, of the world, really, and um, one that I have had it has been a privilege to have had um, time to work with that library over the years. Um, so, um, prayer and plague. Um, like human beings, every text has a tale of its own. And Jewish texts often tell tales of travel in space and time, sometimes to destinations they would neither have intended nor predicted. And um, today I, I want to focus on prayer texts that uh, serve their users in times of plague. So for obvious reasons why we're on Zoom, right? <laughs> um, past pandemics have become popular and um, new research hits the internet almost daily. So the scientific studies by geneticists, epidemiologists, archeologists, zooarchaeologists, paleobiologists, and others have earned more than a few headlines and breathless reportage. Um, Yersinia pestis, the bacillus that causes bubonic plague um, has been identified in ancient DNA samples dating back to the Bronze Age now. And uh, let's see if I can do this here. Um, yeah, there you go. Um, if I can, ah, okay, I'm not so good with this. Let's see, there we go. Um, here you see it, right? So um, the, full, um, the full genome for Yersinia pestis, the bacillus for plague, right, was successfully mapped um, by um, a team of scientists at the Max Planck Institute in 2011, so a little over a decade ago. And today you can find its phylogenetic tree, which you see here in um, all kinds of plague scholarship, even Hebrew Union College lectures, right? So, um, um, and sometimes you see it in a more cluttered form like this, right? So you get a sort of um, terrifying look at it. But, um, but, um, but what you can see actually compared to COVID, this is not a genetics lecture, but, um, but here's our Bronze Age uh, plague, which becomes extinct, right? And it becomes extinct because it doesn't know how to get into a flea. Um, but here um, is where it figures out the flea trick and starts um, multiplying, right? This kind of big bang that we talk about is what leads to the um, Justinianic plague of the fifth century, right? And then the Black Death and our own plague, right? So um, um, today, right? 
um, less headline grabbing than that dramatic stuff is um, the work of historians and scholars of literature, but that too has turned in new directions. So in fact, we're seeing a rare moment of interdisciplinary collaboration between scientists and humanities scholars, and it continues to rewrite what is known about how past societies thought, wrote, and responded to pandemic disease. Bubonic plague, like our own pandemic, inspired lots of writing. Medical tracts, municipal ordinances, chronicles, epitaphs, amulets, poetry, sermons, and even fiction, inscriptions, and motets. Plague liturgy has received less attention than other genres and almost none for the Jewish sources. So today I want to show you some examples of individual prayers and extended liturgies that found use in plague epidemics. And they testify to the ongoing vitality of prayer as a response to sickness and pandemic and to the astonishing capacity of ancient texts to absorb new meaning. Um, a lot of this material um, is also drawn from my new book, Writing Plague, right, which should be out this fall, but, um, but um, the HUC material is not, the cloud material. So what we call the Black Death um, spanned far longer and wider than a few years in Europe, where um, current mortality estimates for the Black Death usually range from 30 to 60 to 90 percent, right, some more in some regions, less in others. Um, but historians now locate the origins of this second plague pandemic right, um, in what is now Kyrgyzstan as early as the 1230s, so really a good hundred years earlier, reaching Europe in 1347. Um, bubonic plague swept the continent with startling speed, and subsequent outbreaks continued for several, for 400 years actually. Um, newer historical work has taken pains to distinguish responses to later outbreaks from the great mortality of 1347 to 52 for obvious reasons. The Black Death caught its victims unprepared. Its mortality and impact were unprecedented. The forces that were mobilized to treat it or stop it while drawing on pre-existing practices were largely improvised and they were so obviously ineffectual that most, even quarantines for instance, um, were tried and then abandoned for decades. Later outbreaks in contrast tended to be local. Um, they were lower in mortality and they landed more heavily on the poor. Um, so, um, it was possible for medical and municipal authorities to believe that something they were doing was working, right? That expertise and experience were um, successful in managing plague. Much of my recent interest has been this great Italian plague of 1630-31. And that's often described as the worst plague outbreak in Italy since the Black Death and one of the most documented. The death of the Duke of Mantua in 1627 spilled the Thirty Years' War into Northern Italy and plague soon followed. Contemporary chroniclers blamed the invading German armies for the pestilence, but plague reached a region that was already suffering from drought, famine, and economic distress. And it came with disease companions, typhus certainly, and likely a variety of other ailments. Indeed, Yersinia pestis, the plague bacillus, had made a home in Northern Italy for centuries following the Black Death, and war just tipped the balance on longer trends of ecological disruption, changing patterns of land use, commercial traffic, and climate disruption. Following a winter lull, the plague resurged in Milan in March of 1630, reached Bologna by May, then Florence and Tuscany and Mantua and Padua were struck that summer. 
whether German soldiers imported Yersinia pestis into Italy or whether they added it to an existing reservoir, we don't know. But genetic studies confirm that the Yersinia pestis strain that characterized this outbreak is a direct descendant of the Black Deaths. And in 1630, the outcome was very similar, a stunning mortality that unfolded swiftly pausing briefly in some regions during the colder months and resuming in the spring at a frantic pace. The Paduan ghetto did not mark the end of the outbreak until August of 1631. And there and elsewhere, sputtering recurrences startled weary communities into the following year. Jewish sources, Narratives, poems, community records, sermons, and prayers capture the shock and panic of this crisis, as well as the weary numbness that concluded it. Prayer in times of plague did not require innovation. Psalms and petitionary liturgies remained popular options, and we find plenty of reference to their continued use. Sometimes, however, the desire to modify or reinterpret existing texts also left traces, as did the rarer impulse to compose something entirely new. And I want to share a few examples, first of a modified text, then an original one, and finally a revitalized but familiar um, liturgy. So I begin with a well-known medieval poet, Abraham Ibn Ezra, who lived long before the second pandemic and would have been a, a surprised to earn association with its woes. So if you know anything about Avraham Ibn Ezra, right, um, memorably, the vicissitudes of his own history, um, he died in 1167, right, but traveled all over Europe, um, um, led him far afield from um, his native Iberia including a sojourn in Italy, where his poetry left a lasting impact on local literary tastes. So in his very large corpus, one minor poem, El Yisrael Nigrata Lefani, Once You Were Called the God of Israel, caught the attention of a late medieval Jew named Solomon in Perugia who survived a plague outbreak in 1374. The piut is a gula, emphasizing God's redemptive power. And its theme is the loss of Jewish sovereignty and the indignity of life in Gentile lands. Apparently, however, Solomon in Perugia read it differently. Ibn Ezra's first verse alludes to King Hezekiah on his sickbed, reprieved from his skin affliction, affliction by heartfelt prayer, right, in Isaiah 38. His second verse cites Isaiah 26 as part of Ibn Ezra's theme of foreign dominion, but the full sweep of Isaiah 26 includes the prophet's grim depiction of a great city humbled dead who do not rise, and an injunction to enter your chambers, stay home, right, <laughs> until God's anger has passed, an apt description of a city struck by plague. And by the time the second stanza opens with the first Samuel 419 and a description of a plague unleashed on the Israelites, it's easy to see how Ibn Ezra's poem could find new meaning. Let's see if I can do this. There we go. I don't know why this doesn't work. Here, okay. Um, it's testimony to the vitality of liturgical thinking that Solomon of Perugia, whoever he was, um, could do what he did next. He added a new stanza to Ibn Ezra's poem. And it looks like this, right? So you have the Hebrew and my translation. Ha'alena arucha umarpe, l'cholei amcha el rachman rofe, 
עצור מגפה מהים לחם מצפה, חלי דבר ומשחית ולא נספה, ותאמר למלאך ידך הרפה, ופאנו אדוני ונרפה. רב לנו לחיות, לבוז לחיות, אדומיות, חיתיות, קדר נוויות. ויבואונו רחמך כי גורלנו מעולם שמך. Solomon alludes to Jeremiah 8, verse 22, where the prophet asks, why does God withhold his healing? Rashi focused on Jeremiah's eight, Jeremiah 8's unburied corpses, which have been removed unceremoniously by the Chaldeans while the traumatized Israelites fail to react. Another plague topos, right, as plague mortality created terrible logistical problems for burial and for um, removal of bodies. Solomon also alludes to plague scenes in Numbers 17 and 2 Samuel 24 before he restitches his stanza back into the Ibn Ezra's theme of lost sovereignty. And this composite text, sometimes when you see it in manuscripts, it's just the stanza scribbled in the margin. Sometimes the whole thing is written out. He cleverly starts it with a hey, so he slides it in before the last stanza and moves the acrostic from Avram to Avraham, right? Um, so it looks like it belongs there. It was a big hit, right? Um, and it survives in numerous Italian liturgies from the late 14th century on. So Solomon's decision to hitch a ride on a golden age um, favorite was unusual, but um, repurposing old hymns was not. A Venetian plague liturgy printed in 1630 also incorporated medieval hymns from Spain and Provence, testimony to the influence of the Spanish exiles right in um, Italy who came in 1492. And some of those hymns are very old. One is of unknown authorship, but found in a famous Burgundian machsor that was copied in 1304. Another is by David ben Bakuda, Sephardic author of the expulsion period. And like Ibn Ezra, these long dead authors would have been surprised by their 17th century context. Uh, but uh, ironically, the displacement gave them new life. Original poetic compositions also survived. And uh, one late medieval example is by Daniel ben Michiel Anav of uh, Montalcino, and it survives in one 14th century and one 15th century Roman rite liturgy. There are a few print liturgies that contain it also. Um, it uh, starts, Darash Nucha, the Cholev, right? We have sought you with all our hearts. And it's five mono-rhymed mono quatrains that also embed David's name and Daniel's name in acrostic. And in the first stanza, um, the people ask, seek God in petition. And in the last stanza, they hope their petition will be received. And in the interior stanzas, um, they plead with God to heed the plague stricken community. The biblical proof texts in this PU favor Psalms, many of which were familiar from petitionary prayers. And it, the poem is studded with imperatives. And so that the whole, the pute sounds this recurring chord of desperation. So here you have the second stanza, right? And so, um, it's very um, actually simple. And um, um, the text overall describes this kind of vertical hierarchy, right? Where the human supplicants are broken and low and raising their eyes up to heaven. And God is high up in heaven and on his throne, right? And the poet begs God to have mercy and answer their prayer, right? To stop the sickness and plague and save them, right? To, forgive them to work wonders, end the pestilence, sword, famine, the mashchit, the destroying angel, right? And the plague, right? Save them, recall their chosenness, 
see their suffering from his throne of mercy, right? And the poem actually offers no sense of uplift or resolution, but it leaves the people's anguished prayer just suspended in a final plea for clemency. It's such a simple text and its proof texts are so familiar, right? It's Psalms, right? Um, that it suggests that it lent itself to antiphonal recitation, right? Where um, the co a congregation could have recited a re the refrain, right? Um, um, and somebody would have chanted the stanzas. Several phase phrases also echo the plague liturgies I'm going to discuss next, such as this plea to end plague and pestilence and sword and whatever, right? Um, and the invocation of God's throne of mercy. So logically, this, this poem belongs to a longer uh, plague liturgy. And, um, and you get a sense of how that might have worked from a later example, also original by a poet named Joseph Baruch Urbino in Rome. And um, he composed a collection he called Slichot al Tsarat Hadever Shalot Tavo, right? Penitential hymns to repel the plague. And it's actually an entire liturgy so that it alternates the prayers with his own pew team that he slots in between them. So those are original. Um, more typically, early modern communities at least preferred to repurpose their old prayers intact and just move them into new settings. And the Clow Library has a rare copy of a um, Mantuan liturgy that was recited in 1630 and it illustrates this approach. So Mantua had the misfortune to not only be dealing with plague, but with a siege. And the siege and sack of Mantua in the summer of 1630 brought German troops into the city. Uh, and three days later, they expelled the Jews. So when Jewish survivors returned the next year, Mantua's general population had shrunken from approximately 50,000 to 10,000. And of an estimated 2,500 Jews who had lived in the ghetto before the plague and expulsion, nearly 1,000 were lost to sickness, violence, homelessness, and hunger. During the final days of the siege, when they couldn't know that that was going to be the outcome, Mantuan Jews gathered in prayer. And their prayers alternated timeless tropes of repentance and redemption with more recent historical markers and appeals for relief from famine, siege, and plague. The 17th century printer thought that at least part of this liturgy dated back to 1402 when Bologna was besieged during a plague outbreak. So they have a model, right? And, um, and this little preface here is what I've translated for you on the side. And, um, and it says, this prayer was found in a manuscript by the Gaon, right? the honorable teacher and Rabbi Matatyahu right? in, um, in Bologna, right? In, six, in 1402, right? um, when Bologna was under siege, he wrote that this prayer augured salvation. So too, may the Lord our God have pity and compassion on us and deliver us from trouble to relief with peace for us and all Israel, amen. Plague and siege, of course, were threatening Mantua. So this looked good because it was encouraging that in 1402, these prayers had actually worked, right? The siege of the city was broken when Galeazzo, the duke who was leading the assault, suddenly died of plague. Right? Um, however, in 1630, the Mantuans were not so lucky and Rabbi Matatyahu's siege breaking prayer did not work. This did not, however, stop people from using it. And, um, and an alternative longer version of this prayer um, even makes its plague connection explicit. And that version survives in an occasional penitential liturgy used somewhat later by the Ashkenazi community in Mantua. And the expanded um, Ashkenazi version elevates plague motifs 
reaching all the way back to the Black Death when plague and persecution had mingled before. That connection is strengthened by um, a long Yizkor section to this in this liturgy, which lists over 70 towns spanning central Ashkenaz to Poland, whose Jewish communities knew lethal pogroms. At least half of the towns on the list experienced anti-Jewish violence during the Black Death, memorialized here not as an epidemiological event, but as the memory of those attacks. So although the, liter the language of these liturgies varies, they recycle phrases and language um, pleading for relief from a comprehensive string of disasters, many of which did come hand in hand. The Mantuan text also makes room for their um, Christian neighbors. This Ashkenazi version says that um, um, it asks for God to prevent Mane Magefa, right? To prevent this plague, Minachalatcha, Ubzor Alehem the Alenu, right? Um, zero to vote, right? So, um, bring them and us, right? Um, um, and that kind of interfaith generosity, which interests me, but is, is not something I found in a lot of earlier examples, but it does show up um, in some later periods. And I found at least two in uh, the Clow collection. Um, one, an early 19th century Piedmontese liturgy and the other a little later also from um, Mantua. So this manuscript right, is actually um, adapting itself not only to um, more ecumenical spirit, but um, to other, uh, other pathogens, right? Because it, um, it's, it covers plague, there's smallpox, Abu Ma'od, right? Um, and variola, right? Um, varoli, right? That's a smallpox. So we've got plague, smallpox, and cholera in here. And, and as you can see, these liturgies can adapt themselves to um, the introduction of new diseases. Um, and um, I like Abigail, who was so kind to send these scans, right? You can see in this scan that this was folded up, right? Um, you can see it better from the back, right? Um, so um, however it was used, it may have had a kind of amulet status too, right? Because it's going to be folded up and uh, kept, kept somewhere, right? Um, Another Clow manuscript, which I like very much, um, it's also early um, 19th century, so not, not medieval or early modern at all, but um, it preserves what fascinates me about this one is that it's actually um, adapted for the language of a zoonotic, for an animal plague, an animal epidemic, and probably from the little description I see here, I would guess that it's rinder pest, a cattle disease. And it prays for the stricken um, animals, right? Um, as well as for the farmers who are unable to harvest grain without their oxen, right? And um, so I've extracted that little passage from the, um, from the inside, right? You see, he's still quoting the biblical verses, right? But um, but um, commenting, right, the, the Lord has, you know, strikes the cattle from the biblical plague that's on the cattle, right, on um, Exodus 9, with a grievous plague that's in the surrounding cities, right, near and far, how the cattle groan, right, right? Um, the herds are bewildered and helpless from Joel, right, um, and the farmers um, need, right, so it's not just compassion for the animals, but, and it's true that when animals have render pests, they make heart-rending groans. Um, the descriptions are throughout more modern literature, right, but, um, but here, um, it's also an economic problem, right, the farmers can't um, harvest grain without oxen, right? or, um, so without cattle, um, they have no means of harvesting. And without harvesting the grain, there's no bread in the city. So you see the kind of um, supply chain issues that are very familiar to us today, right? But, um, but also the, the interlinking of rural and urban environments and um, animal 
and human fate, right? Um, so these liturgies are really highly adaptable. Probably the most successful example of liturgical recycling targeted a really old liturgy with roots, in fact, in the rabbinic period, the Pitum Haktorit passages that describe the incense offered in the biblical sanctuary. So some of you will know that the morning and afternoon liturgy incorporates these passages and their readings from Exodus 30 verses um, 34 to 36 and 7 to 8 that describe God commanding Moses to prepare incense, right? Um, and there's also a combined passage from uh, the Babylonian Talmud Kritot 6a, right? And the Yerushalmi Yoma 4.5, describing the preparation, composition, and storage of the incense. Even before the Talmud, of course, right, incense and plague had biblical associations, right? So we know that in number 17, right, Moses commands Aaron to prepare incense to halt a plague that's raging among the Israelites. And medieval commentators emphasized the prophylactic power of the incense. So did the Zohar. Um, um, early modern Italian Jews uh, took this um, idea even further. So Abraham Portaglione um, wrote something called the Shilte Hagibur, right? And it includes 11 chapters discussing the biblical incense, praising. Moses' pharmacological expertise. Um, Porta Leone showed off his biblical and rabbinic learning, but also his knowledge of Dioscorides, the classical botanical corpus, and what he learned from, quote, spice grinders and pharmacists in Mantua, unquote. His botanical interests were shared by Christian humanists whose enthusiasm for classical botanical and pharmacological works was renowned, as were the lavish gardens where they cultivated exotic and medicinal plants. So Christians and Jews would scour the countryside, right, for specimens of plants and try to identify them against the Greek sources, right, and they would um, seek apothecaries out to compound them. In fact, um, you did not have to go very far to witness the compounding of drugs in early modern Italian cities, and especially the most wondrous drug of all, theriac, the most potent, so it was believed, remedy against plague. Within each city, pharmacies promoted their own special trademark formulas based on the classical recipes, um, the recipes of the classical sources were, of course, problematic because their ingredients were difficult to identify against a local plant repertoire, right? And, um, and because the ancient Greek sources didn't list um, amounts when they, <laughs> when they list the ingredients, right? So um, one thing that shows up consistently in theriac um, recipes is female vipers. And another thing is opium, right? Um, well, female vipers are apparently um, around in the spring. That's when they give birth. And um, therefore, theriac production in Italy became an annual springtime affair. It engaged the general public as apothecaries were required by law to display their vipers and drugs for three days prior to compounding them. And the spicers who ground the ingredients also labored in the open, lining up before the stalls with their giant mortars and pestles, pounding and chanting in unison. This is a late 17th century, um, or maybe mid 17th century, I forget, um, image. Um, it's the in front of the pharmacy in, in, um, in Venice, right? Um, and local Jews might easily connect this scene to the Pitum Haktorit, right? Because the Talmudic excerpts also, they itemize the incense ingredients and they describe this annual gathering of spice grinders who pound away 
with a foreman who calls out, grind it finely, grind, finely grind it, because the rhythm, the rhythmic sound is good for the spices. So for intellectuals like Portaglioni, the prophylactic properties of biblical incense were proof that sacred Jewish sources preserved the remnants of scientific expertise once the intellectual property of the Jews, but plundered by the nations. Jewish physicians often explicitly identified the aromatic fumigations of the medical regimens with the incense of the biblical cult. In Neoplatonist terms, the biblical incense had worked by attracting and redirecting the sympathy of a celestial body and the incense liturgy combined verbal and performative acts to replicate that process. A litany of verses and supplications grew up around the base, the kernel of the incense readings. And most of them are attributed to Joseph Ibn Shraga, who was a Kabbalist and another refugee of the 1492 expulsion from Spain. So the standard text incorporates the following language, right? And usually it can vary a little, right? So rebuke and stop the plague, right, among us. May it be your will, O Lord, our God, and the God of our fathers, right, to end among us and all your people, the house of Israel, pestilence, sword, famine, grief, sign, evil, the destroying angel, right, the mashchit, the plague, the evil inclination, evil disease, the evil adversary, evil annihilation, all wicked evil diseases that come into the world. So um, in, in medicine, we call that broad spectrum, right? <laughs> if you want a broad spectrum approach. Um, but you can recall echoes of this language, right? In Daniel Ben Yechiel's piyut, right? And um, which reinforces my claim that his piyut was somehow attached to a larger liturgy. And when we see variations on this text, right? Um, they, they do suggest that they've been tweaked for local conditions. Sometimes, in fact, frequently, um, um, copies of this liturgy insert an unpronounceable angel name into the closing litanies. And I want to return to that name in a moment, but um, it's one more indication of the theurgic um, aspects of this liturgy. So Kabbalah, of course, is we consider an occult science, right? But by the 16th century, many of its concepts had splashed beyond the borders of esotericism permeating and diluted form, religious and metaphysical disciplines, including medicine. Um, the connection um, between the aromatic fumigations of the medical regimens and the incense of the biblical cult is illustrated um, beautifully in the Moshiach um, Chosim, a 1587 plague regimen by Avraham Yagel which contains an extensive section on incense. What else? So Yagel explains that the ancient incense was compounded to attract celestial effluvia to sympathetic earthly forms, redirecting planetary forces to purify the corrupted air, the miasma that causes plague. And um, Yagel's regimen concludes with pill, a few recipes for pills, right? Some sgulot and a commentary on Psalm 36 that then leads where else to the Pitum Haktorit liturgy that closes his regimen. And his text includes the angel name uh, associated with plague prevention. This is a Klau copy, 1587. What a beauty, right? And um, there you see this kind of unpronounceable thing right there. Um, here's a, a, another Klau manuscript, right? Um, the Pitumak Torah right there. And there you see the name also, right? Kind of um, buried in there, right? Um, so the first, what is this thing, right? Um, this is where it, it's helpful to... Um, know people like Yossi Chayas, who has talked for you before, right? But um, 
um, the first six letters, right, come from the words, right, um, Sri Dvash, right, Hot Lot Botnim Shkedim, right, um, the choice produce of the land that Jacob instructs Judah to take down to Egypt, some balm, honey, gum, lemon, pistachios, almonds, right, um, it's from Genesis 43, verse 11. But the second, um, I don't know if I can go backwards, but um, the second six letters um, jump forward one letter, right, from each of these, right? I don't know, can I go backwards? Yes. Um, so, um, right, Kuf is one letter past Dalid, He is one letter uh, past Zadi, He is one letter past Dalid, right? Samif is one letter past Noon, right? So, so um, you jump forward one for the next six, and then you back up again and take the same six, just combine them into one pile, right? And um, as Moshe Idel has shown, the use of this name as an anti plague adjuration can be traced back to Joseph de la Reina and a Kabbalist named Isaac de Leon. And both were wonder working mystics active in Spain prior, prior to the 1492 expulsion. So here we are a century later, 1587 um, at least, right, um, where we find that um, this angel is still busy in Northern Italy um, combating plague, but with cutting edge medicine. Right? Um, so um, for Jewish physicians like Iago or Portelioni, incense was therefore a biblically sanctioned method for purifying pestilential air. For lay people, prayer bestowed agency denied them as medical consumers, something we can identify with. So too, Preparing scented fires and bed sheets like reliance on amulets and angels engaged men and women in repelling the angel of death. Today, it may startle us to read Yagel's recommendation for starting the day open mouthed in the outhouse for 30 minutes to acclimate and immunize yourself to putrefaction in the air. But the recommendation was made to men and women tending afflicted family members amidst the unbearable stench of plague or shot in their homes where the sounds and smells of sickness were no respecter of walls. Did the exercise build immunity? Who knows? But like music, prayer, and angels names, it offered a way to stay human that was very much under siege. Even for those who did not worry about whether our biblical fathers were scientists before Dioscorides and Galen, medical ways of thinking saturated Jewish and Christian contexts. In a recent study, Michael Rusick examined a, gr a group of vernacular Judeo-Italian women's prayer books. You have some of them there at the cloud too, right? Um, and some of these uh, women's prayer books include the Pitum HaKtorit readings. So what translation did Italian Jewish women see for the Hebrew word suri, balm, in um, some Sidur's, right, stakte in the JPS Bible and uh, for Lusitanius, right? Um, um, the Judeo-Italian translation is theriac, the famous antidote. To encounter this word in prayer for women who might be literate, but who were not reading Kabbalah or Galen confirms that medicine and liturgy were not strange partners even beyond the elite circles of book loving men. They worked and belonged together. In some, our early ancestors, modern ancestors saw no contradiction between prayer and medicine. Prayer, like the men and women who used it, expressed a variety of beliefs, traditions, tastes, and remedies to respond to catastrophe. An intellectual elite was not too learned to find solace in ancient litanies, and a less learned laity could recognize medical science in prayer language. For both of them, science and faith 
work together. The causative agent of bubonic plague, Yersinia pestis, was discovered in 1894. Caught early, it can now be treated by common antibiotics. One day, COVID may prove that treatable, but we are in an age of emerging and re-emerging pathogens, and so far, they prove nimbler than Homo sapiens. Science will get smarter, but for the foreseeable future, there will still be room for prayer. A menu of possibilities suited the great cities of modern, pre-modern Italy. We may be less creative than our learned ancestors, but three years into our own pandemic, we have behaved in surprisingly similar ways. Thank you. Wow, thank you. That was really wonderful. Uh, we have a few great questions here, so I'm going to just scroll back up and get started. We have a few minutes here. Um, the first one is from Rabbi Colin Eimer, and the question is that there is a Church of Santa Maria della Salute in Venice that was built in gratitude at having survived the plague of 1630 to 1631. And they want to know, are there any similar architectural remnants in any Jewish communities at having survived the plague or liturgies at having survived? There's um, a tombstone, that uh, a grave marker that um, in the San Lido Cemetery, I think it's in Padua, um, that's, um, it marks the mass grave of the Jewish um, victims of this plague. Um, that's an architectural, a small architectural <laughs> survival, right? Um, um, there, well, they, no, there wasn't a custom of like building monuments or shrines or anything like that. So that um, I don't know of, but these liturgies do survive, right? Um, and they just um, are forgotten a lot of the time. Um, so that's, we're not, you're not likely, when I worked on the Black Death more, um, in places, there you also have the problem of mass burials, right? But in, in places where the plague was not as severe, for instance, Toledo, Spain, um, you can find epitaphs, right? You have individual gravestones with epitaphs. Um, but in most cases, there are mass burials and not even that opportunity. But, but prayers, poems, right? So it just takes combing through things because this is not something that a lot of our databases, um, even though they are light years ahead of where they were 10, 20 years ago, right? Um, they're not often indexed for uh, play. But um, as far as like buildings or shrines, or I don't know of anything. Okay, that's, so let's go back for a moment to prophylactic. Um, Ruth Langer wants to know, was there any sense of avoiding contagion by avoiding communal prayer? Or were these all prayers recited in the, in the community with the minion? Yeah, um, thanks Ruth. Um, um, Yoram and I were talking before the lecture about this remarkable um, chronicle by um, Avram Catalano, Olamafuch. Um, he's in the Paduan ghetto during the plague. And um, he describes the prayer life in great disarray, they, um, um, that they, they can't even scramble together a minion a lot of the time, like they have trouble um, getting people to to come. They do have these confraternities, right, where they sometimes are um, enlisting people to pray early, right, um, on behalf of the community. But, um, but his description is sort of sad, right? He says people are playing all out of order. They're not following the liturgy properly. They're not showing up. They can barely get a quorum, right? Um, um, he also describes um, very movingly, right? Things where, like the the rabbi, there are twenty four rabbis when the plague starts in Padua, and there's one who survives. Right? But what he at one point he um, 
instructs people to say the vidui, right, the deathbed confession, before they get sick. And, um, and he tells them to stand in their doorways and say the prayer with a, a, a quorum stationed in the street, like across the street, so people don't have to come close, but they will be witnessing it, right? And um, so there is, um, Catalano himself at some point is quarantined because one of his kids is sick and a servant, and he consults with people through the window, right? So, um, so they do, we know that's what Christians were doing, right? Is that they were praying through the windows and in their doorways and, um, you find some evidence of that happening with the Jewish community too. Um, so another question about prayer. So most of the ones that we looked at, I think all the ones that we looked at were addressed to God specifically to be the, the savior. Um, and the question here what is asking whether you've come across prayers that address the matriarchs or patriarchs, you know, beseech them for their assistance or intervention. Yeah, there's one liturgy I have that actually um, it's divided up into, I think, six or seven sections, and it's a kind of zuchut avot, right, like on the merits of the fathers, and each section focuses on this one's for Abraham, this one's for Isaac, right, you know, and, um, so the prayers are organized in that way. I don't think, it didn't have the women, but it did have, um, I th I, I'd have to check my notes, but it, it had a list of, the, of, of you know, different um, patriarchs, right? That was the problem. <laughs> yeah, maybe that was it. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it may it may actually be a reaction in some way because, of course, Mary is very prominent in um, um, plague repelling um, prayers among Christians. So they may be cautious about um, looking too alike. Right? So. Getting them involved. Uh, let's see, we have time for one or two more questions. Again, from Rabbi Colin, we have a question. Were there any liturgies of offering thanks for survival? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I haven't looked for them. There, there are definitely um, descriptions of prayer after, um, at the, yes, of these kind of Thanksgiving um, prayers. Um, there's, here comes the cat, um, uh, but um, they're, they're, they're oh, I'm helpless, but, um, but um, they, I haven't actually looked into what liturgies were used. Um, that, that's a great question. That's a, that's a nice thing to set me looking. <laughs> for the next chapter after we've all survived the corona. Um, and that's actually leads us to the next question from Francis Eek. Uh, what can we learn from Jewish liturgy prayer in the past towards responding to the coronavirus today? You know, that's a question I've been asked multiple times over the last few years and answered differently each time, right? Because our own experience has changes, right? Um, um, and where we are collectively today feels to me and from what I observe, right? Very different um, from where we were when this thing started, right? Um, um, the beginnings of our pandemic, right? I think we would have identified more with some of the Black Death literature, right? Because it's that sense of novelty, like, whoa, what the hell is going on, right? And nothing, and you don't even know what to try, which is what the 14th century physicians experienced, right? They they don't know what's going to work, right? They're just trying stuff, right? Um, and um, that is very much where we were, right? Um, three years later, where more where I think some of these texts um, are, right? Um, and it's tired. Right? Um, there's, a, there's a sense of fatigue that um, if you read again, Catalano's um, Paduan Chronicle right? at the end, you see these like us, like we call them variants, right? <laughs> but um, but they um, 
these sputtering kind of like they think it's gone, then there's some, you know, and in their case, it could not, maybe not be plague, right? It could be people are getting, coming down with typhus or some other fever, right? Um, um, disease, right? They don't always distinguish so clearly among them, but, um, but it's that feeling of, we thought we were done, right? And then the fear of everything being closed down again and the, um, the, the damage to the economy, right? The, um, the, the loss of time, which in our, in lives, right? Which we feel so, so strongly, right? Um, um, so I think, I think we, we identify, if I had a put us in a sort of a pin, like in the pandemic, um, the plague map there, I put us um, later, right? Because we're, we're at the point where we could really identify with, um, with this, it's coming back, you know, this thing isn't going away. And now what do we do? How do we live with this? And you can feel them asking that question. Thank you. Um, I think that is all the time we're going to take for questions today, but I want to thank you for the presentation. Uh, for, I learned a lot today, and I want to just hand it back to Yoram for a moment. So, uh, thank you, Susan, for your beautiful lecture. It's, we really learned a lot, and we hope to see you again with, with another lecture soon. Thank you. Thank you all. And I'll be happy to send out a link if anybody would like a link to the Zoom recording. And uh, maybe if Dr. Einbinder wants to take any questions by email, we can connect yeah. you with that. <laughs> I'd be delighted. I love this stuff. So please, it's just my UConn email, Susan I'm dot Einbinder at UConn.edu. Happy to hear from you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. See you next time. Thank you.